The church at Corinth, uh, everyone is aware of the fact, is a church that had a lot of problems. Many times I've said to myself, I thank God I wasn't called to pastor the church at Corinth. Uh, Ray Steadman years ago used to call it First Californians. Because of all the immorality and the problems that were in the church at Corinth. And many times people say, well, we, we got to get back to the church of the New Testament. And I think, which one do you want to go back to? There were so many that had problems. The church has never been perfect, and it never will be perfect, except for its position in Christ. So the problems in Corinth, Corinth actually made it possible for Paul to respond and correct them. And so we're still many times having the same problems. And so the correction that we get in Corinthians helps us to be able to understand how we should function as a church. Well, from verse 17 down to verse 34, the end of the chapter, Paul actually is dealing with the problem of what is known as the Lord's Supper. We call it communion. Some call it the Eutychus, which means the giving of thanks. So he's giving them very explicit instruction as to what should take place when they gather together publicly and they celebrate the Lord's Supper as we are again here tonight. So there's two divisions to this text I want you to note. The first is the problem in verse 17 to 22. The second is the pattern and purpose for the Lord's Supper in verse 23 down to verse 34. Let's follow this outline. And first of all, look at the problem concerning the Lord's Supper in verse 17 down to verse 22. Paul says, now in this that I declare unto you, verse 17, I praise you not that you come together. So he's talking about their gathering corporately together. And he says, I, I, I don't give you any praise for what you're doing, not for the better, but you're doing it for the worse. So in verse 17, he says, when you guys get together as a church, it's actually detrimental. You're not functioning as a body should. You're getting together not for the better, but for the worse. He said, now first of all in verse 18, when you come together in the church, he says, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Now earlier in the book of Corinthians, he said these divisions were because you, there's carnality. Now he calls them babes in Christ, but he says you're carnal in Christ. So they were Christians, but they weren't growing. They weren't maturing. They weren't spiritually minded. They were born of the Spirit, but they weren't led and guided by the Spirit. And they weren't functioning in a biblical way. So Paul is giving them this biblical instruction. So we need to be born again. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, we will be walking in obedience. And walking in obedience is synonymous with being Spirit-filled. You can't be Spirit-filled and disobedient to God's Word. They are one and the same. A Spirit-filled Christian is a Bible-filled Christian, an obedient, surrendered, yielding Christian. So he says, when you come together, it's not for the good, but it's for the worse, and you have divisions among you. These are schisms. And he mentions them again in verse 19, for there must also be heresies or schism, schisma, schismatias in the Greek, among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. The statement just means basically that you have this division and these schisms going on so that some people can show off and get glory and get recognition. When we come together, there's a couple fundamental things that should take place. And one of them is that all the glory, all the praise, all the focus, all the attention should be on Jesus Christ. Should never be on the worship team, should never be on the preacher should never be on the servants, should never be on the light, should never be on the atmosphere. It should all be on Jesus. If it's not, we're missing why we're gathering together. And whenever the church gathers together, another basic principle is there should be mutual edification. Everyone should be instructed, built up, and taught, and Jesus Christ should be glorified. We don't, we don't come to individually go off on our little bless me club kind of trips we come so that we can all be edified, all be instructed, all be built up, and all for the glory of God. Amen? That's why we gather corporately together. And we don't want to gather and defeat the very purpose for which we congregate or get together. So he says there, 
in verse 19, when you come together, speaking again of their public assembly, therefore into one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? Now, he introduces this his topic and saying, you come together and you're coming together for the Lord's Supper. Now, the early church did something we don't do when, when they celebrated the Lord's Supper. They had what they called the love feast before they had communion. And what we call, what we call potluck, they called a love feast. I think Christians should have more potlucks and we, 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 our congregation's too large to meet anywhere in our building to do that. We meet outside, eat outside. We have our uh, monthly meeting outside again in October and we'll barbecue and hang out out there. It's not really a potluck, but just the, the love feast, the, the time together, the sharing of the food and the oriental mind. When you ate together with someone, you became one with them, which is what we're going to do tonight, by the way. We're going to eat the bread. We're going to drink the cup. And we become one as a body of Christ in the Lord. But they had what they called the love feast. It was like a big potluck. And he begins to describe how that was causing problems for the communion service. So imagine the church. They get together. We're going to have communion. But before communion, we have a potluck. And so you bring your food and everyone gets in line. Hungriest bachelor dudes usually get at the front of the line. And they pile it on so high that people at the end of the line have no food left. I remember one time being way at the back of a line, you know, and seeing all this good food, and I waited for a long time, got to the front of the line, and there was like a bowl with peas in it, with one little green pea I put on my plate. Everything else was gone. You're supposed to feel sorry for me. (laughs) And then I looked over at the bachelor dudes that haven't eaten for a whole week, and they had just tons of food piled on their plate. And, you know, they usually bring a bag of chips and the women bring a nice dish and they don't touch their chips. They go right for the nice dishes. But even today, when the church has a potluck, there are problems that come along of people not sharing and being thoughtful of one another. So he says, when you come together, therefore, into one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? He's saying, don't forget the purpose you're gathering. You're not gathering to gorge yourself with food and stuff, but you're coming for the purpose of the Lord's Supper. He says, and he describes what the problem was, for in eating, everyone takes before another. So they were bringing many times their own food, eating that, not sharing it with the poor or probably some of the slaves. And he says, and one is hungry and another, it's in the Bible, it's pretty sad, gets drunk. I mean, every time I read that, I think, I, I, I can't believe that. So they were actually getting glutton. They were, they were just getting stuffed with food, and some people were getting drunk before communion. So that's how messed up this church was. He says, what? Question mark, verse 22. Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Despise ye the church of God and shame them which have not. He's referring to the poor. Many of the early Christians were slaves and They had to bring the little bag of chips and they didn't really have much. And you shame them which have not. What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So their focus shifted. And this is, again, this is foundational. Their focus shifted as to the main purpose of their gathering to celebrate the Lord's Supper in a way that honored and glorified the Lord. And it focused mostly on their own felt needs and their own wants. And this has been a big problem in the church for many years. People gather for them to be blessed with no real focus on blessing others, encouraging others, building others up, and for mutual edification for God to be glorified. So they were basically abusing this love feast, and then they were going into the communion service in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that wasn't reverential, wasn't respectful, wasn't worshipful. And because of that, we're going to see God brought judgment upon them. So that was the problem in verse 17 down to verse 22. But we move now to the pattern and the purpose. And this is probably the best instruction separate from Jesus when he instituted this communion service in the Gospels that you find in the Bible. And what we're going to find in verse 23 to 34 is four facets of the Lord's Supper. So we're going to see four aspects that should be a part 
of the communion service. I encourage you to write them down or to take notes if you're following along. The first is recollection, and that is that we look back, verse 23 to 25. So when we gather together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we remember and we look back, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, I love that's where we get the word eutychus. When He had given thanks, it says, that He break it and said, Take ye, this is My body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance. There's the idea. In remembrance of Me. After the same manner also He took the cup. And when He had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament or covenant in My blood, this do ye as often as you drink in remembrance of Me. And so the first element or facet of the communion service, and this again is so important, is that we look back in recollection or in remembrance. Now, go back with me to verse 23. I want to point out a few things. Paul says, I received of the Lord. In other words, this is a direct revelation from God as to the instructions that you are to follow for communion. This is not just Paul's idea, Paul's you know whim. This is a revelation directly given from the Lord. I received it of the Lord. Now there are two, and only two, ordinances for the church. And those two ordinances for the church are water, baptism, and communion. If you are a church and you are gathering as the body of Christ, those two ordinances should be observed. We should be baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we should be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Now you can gather in a small group in your home and have communion or do it on the beach or wherever, but the body of Christ is to be gathered doing those ordinances. And the ordinance of baptism, we had a baptism just this past Sunday, and uh, I didn't get to go, but I received a picture from Aaron of the group, and I thought I would throw it on the screen for you for those of you that weren't there to get to see all those that were baptized on Sunday afternoon. And one of the things that really blessed my heart was the young people, the number of youth that were being baptized. So there were more than we expected. And we haven't done a baptism in many, 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 many months. So praise the Lord for all those that identified with Jesus and His death burial, and resurrection. And now they can walk with that old man indeed buried and risen with Christ. But the second ordinance is, is that of the Lord's Supper, which was instituted by Jesus the night He was betrayed and He was arrested in the garden in the upper room, which we're studying on Wednesday nights. So He leaves the upper room and He goes to the garden and after He's instituted the Lord's Supper, He's arrested and then crucified. And Jesus actually took the bread and said to eat the bread in remembrance of Me. And then He took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant, My blood. And do it in remembrance of Me. And Paul now amplifies on that institution that Jesus gave us here in this passage that it was directly revealed to Him by the Lord. And he says, I deliver it unto you that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. Now the bread, though He called it His body, I believe was a symbol of His body. That His body was intact, hadn't been crucified yet, but the bread symbolized His body, which was broken for Him, for us, excuse me. And when He had given thanks, so Jesus is about to be crucified. He's going to go to the cross. And what does He do? He gives thanks. You can always be thankful to God for His blessings. And so He break it and said, take eat, this is My body, and it's broken for you. So it symbolizes the body of Christ on the cross. The bread symbolizes His crucifixion broken for us, His death on the cross. This do, here's the important point, in remembrance of Me. Now, I want you to note the order, and this is why we have 
First the bread, and then the cup. First the bread, and then the order now is the cup. Verse 25, after the same manner took he the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often. Now he doesn't tell us how often. Christians sometimes argue how often we should have communion. Some churches have it every Sunday. Some have it every day. Some have it once a month. Some have it once a week. It doesn't matter how often you have it, but you should follow these important facets when you do have it. But as often as you drink this, you do it in remembrance of me. Now the cup is a symbol of a covenant. And that covenant is the new covenant. You can read Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34 where God said He would write His laws upon our heart, and everyone would know Him from the youngest to the eldest. So the new covenant originally was designed and made with Israel, but we as Gentiles were grafted in to the body of Christ, and we became partakers of that new covenant. We're beneficiaries of that new covenant. So this new covenant is our sins can be forgiven, we can be regenerated, have the life of God in us, His laws are written on our hearts, and it is an everlasting covenant that Jesus will never break. Now, notice that we show His death till He comes. That's a marvelous truth. So we have recollection, we look back, and then we have the the second proclamation, we look forward in verse 26. So you do this in remembrance of Me. The new covenant speaking of that He died, why He died for our sins, and how He died willingly. But I love this verse 26. We often pass over it. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, notice the word show there. You do show the Lord's death till He come. The word show is the word in the Greek where we get our our word type from. It's the word tupos. And it was used for an impression that would be made by a hammer on a piece of metal, a dent or an impression. And so it's a picture or a showing. So when we have communion, it's not just only remembering, looking back, recollection, but it's proclaiming and expecting when we're looking ahead. We're showing that He died in the elements, His body and His blood. It's a living tupos, a picture. This is why communion so Great, and and, and we're going to see in just a moment, we should never take communion flippantly or half-heartedly. We should be reverent and really focused on the Lord when we do this. Because this is an ordinance in the church that's a very holy moment. So that bread, though a symbol, reminds us and pictures the broken body of Jesus on the cross. Every time I take communion, I think about the physical sorrow, suffering, pain, agony that He endured for me on that cross. Pain that, that, that I can, can't even begin to imagine what it was like to be crucified. And that He actually did it for me. He did it for you. Such amazing love. So it demonstrates, it shows, it's a tupos, it's a picture of the Lord's death. And then notice the next phrase, till He comes. That's why I say there's proclamation and expectation. Verse 26, we look ahead. So we look back in recollection. We look ahead and we proclaim and we expect. So another thing before we leave verse 26, till He come. Jesus is telling us in the communion service, we actually look forward to the second coming. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, you know what He said? He said, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until I drink it again with you in my Father's kingdom. Isn't that cool? I'm not going to drink this again until it's with you in my Father's kingdom. What's that mean? It means I'm looking forward to that. Every time I drink the cup, I remember He's waiting for me and He's going to drink together with me in the kingdom of God. So it's with expectation that we look forward again. This would be the second coming of Christ when we are with Him together in heaven. Now there's a third element, and that I call examination. It's in verse 27 to 32. We look within. Notice that in verse 27. Wherefore, so He's coming to His conclusion. 
Whosoever shall eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily, in my King James translation, and a better rendering of that would be in an unworthy manner. He's not saying that you have to be worthy because we are none worthy. He's actually saying it must be done in a worthy manner. Shall be guilty of the body and of the blood. And let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh in an unworthy manner eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sick among you, and many have died or fallen asleep. For if we would judge ourselves, there's the point, self-examination. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged of the Lord. But when we judge, we are condemned or chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned of or with the world. Now, Jesus is, uh, the Lord is saying through Paul here, that when we gather together, we need to make sure that we're doing it in a worthy way. Now, I grew up in a church where they actually misinterpreted this section, and they said, you know, if, there, if you've sinned recently, or you're not walking close with the Lord, you shouldn't take communion. No, you should, you should ask God to forgive you. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Communion's for sinners. It's not just for the super saints or the deeper life club or the spiritually elite. And if you don't have to pass the elements, if you're born again and you've trusted Jesus Christ and said, Lord, forgive my sins. I thank you for forgiveness. You're worthy in Christ. But you don't want to do it in a way that dishonors Him. You want to examine your heart. And if there's any sin in your heart or in your life or any sin that's unconfessed and unrepented of, then you need to get right with God before you take the elements. So here's one of the benefits of communion. One of the benefits of communion is it causes us to get right with God. This is why we should be in the communion service. Because it forces us to, is my heart right with God? Is there anything between my soul and the Savior? Is there any sin that's blocking His face or the sunshine of His love in my life? And if there is, confess it and be forgiven and celebrate the Lord's Supper. He said, some of you have done this in an unworthy manner, And because of this, verse 30, this is pretty radical. You are weak, sick, and some have even died. That's pretty heavy. Some of you have gotten sick, you're weak, and some have even died because you're doing it in an unworthy manner. The Lord's chastening. In the book of Hebrews, it says, whom the Lord loves, He chastens. So if we judge ourselves, do our own self-examination, then we will not be judged, that is, by the Lord. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. God chastens us that we should not be condemned with the world. So this is an example of what you read about in Hebrews, where whom the Lord loves, He chastens, corrects us, so that we won't be judged by the world or condemned with the world. Now the last aspect is in verse 33 and 34, and that is, consideration, we look around. Notice then in verse 33, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, tarry one for another. If I were to paraphrase that verse, it would be this. When you get together in church, be considerate of one another. When you gather and corporately worship me, consider one another. Be considerate. Be thoughtful. Remember the mind of Christ in Philippians 2, that he became a servant, gave himself to serve and to sacrifice for others. Then he says in verse 34, and if any man is hungry, let him eat at home. And when you come not together unto the con- to condemnation, the rest I will put in order when I come. I, I like how practical Paul says. He goes, look, If you can't maintain when you come to the love feast, eat at home, okay? 
just eat at home before you come to church so you're not pigging out at church and messing everything up and selfishly running in front of others and not being considerate. So he's basically saying, look, look, come on, you guys, consider others, be thoughtful of others, be concerned for others. When you come to church, even aside from the Lord's Supper, think about others. If you spy someone across the sanctuary that looks sad, what's wrong with going over and saying, hi, how are you? What's, can I pray for you? Reaching out to them, being concerned for them, being considerate one of another, loving one another, forgiving one another, serving one another. And if you come to a communion service and you have aught with your brother or sister, you need to get right with them. You need to ask God to forgive you. So communion has a cleansing effect on the church and it has a, a reminder of the cross and brings us brokenness and the anticipation of the Lord coming. All of this is taking place in the elements are served and when we worship the Lord. So here are the, here, here, here's a survey of what we covered. Recollection, we look back. Proclamation and expectation, we look ahead. Examination, we look within. And consideration, we look around. So we're going to pray, and hopefully you've gotten your elements. And I encourage you to kind of, in anticipation of communion, get the wrapper peeled off your elements and just hold it and get ready because we're going to pray together and we're going to meet the Lord in the Lord's Supper together. Let's pray.